I guess that, you know, many people in Bengal and the rest of India go to the temple whenever it's the, the holy days and, you know, give um, offerings to the goddess Kali. But the goddess Kali is not the goddess Kali without, it's the goddess Kali within. It's the, um, it's the experience of, uh, in, in the tantric tradition, that the goddess or the god is within you, not outside you. You do a puja, an Indian puja, whether you're a Vaishnava or a Shaiva, you're actually possessed, you're, you're visualizing the goddess or the god within your heart, so you're possessed. Mm. What you do is you take it on a flower or anything, onto a yantra or, you know, onto a book or onto, you know, a human being, you're possessed and you're actually, you um, delivering something, that's, that's what tantric initiation is like too, you know, if you initiate a person, you take the goddess of the god into your own heart, you know, the mantra vibrates hopefully, rather than being a symbolic thing, and you are, you're possessed. Um, Hello and welcome to the Spirit Box podcast, where we explore magic, folklore, and the worlds of the spirits and everything in between. So today we are joined by author and journalist Mike McGee. Uh, Mike McGee is a well-known name to lovers and practitioners of Tantra, to whom he has offered for decades the essential condensed contents of many Tantra of the medieval period. Kali magic is divided into two sections. The first, Sadhana, deals extensively with various aspects of ritual worship of Kali, such as the preparation of her mantras, the protective armors, uh, which can be recited and woven into the Sadhaka's body um, via Nadyaza. <laughs> pronunciation. Uh, also covered the very form, various forms of Kali, their dhyanas and nitya goddesses and other deities who surround Kali in her yantras. And the second section is Tantras. This consists of a complete translations of three key texts, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. But it goes through um, the alchemical side of things, how Shiva um, reveals how liberation can be achieved through enjoyment, the secrets of wine, the preparation of ashes, the auspiciousness of eclipses, all this kind of work. Um, and then there is uh, some further work with the infamous uh, Yoni Tantra, which is deeply, deeply explicit. Um, uh, incredible stuff that would remind you, what reminded me of some of um, Western secrets of Western ritual magic. And um, for any devotee of, of Kali magic, really, this is an invaluable resource. And it really, really gives great insights into the nature of worship and forms of, of Kali in all her um, in all her glory. Now in the plus show, we get into a little bit more of a discussion around the the tantric rituals uh, that I just mentioned, and I, and I kind of made that juxtaposition with Western ritual magic, and we go through how Kali represents the killing of ego, that the the great sword she wields is for chopping off the head of one's ego. We talk about the similarities between um, in Tantra between sex and death. Um, and Mike is a pains to stress the importance of waking up to being uh, fully aware. And then we discuss how he sourced the materials found in the book and, and his journey with that translation. So if you want to hear the plus show, you know what to do. Clicky linky and, um, and away you go. Subscribe on Patreon. Now, before we hit go, I'm going to read in part the, the foreword um, to the book, which is uh, written by Phil Hine. And of course, uh, Twisted Trunk Books is uh, Phil's um, publishing company, uh, who do some uh, really, really incredible work. And uh, Mike's been published um, before uh, by Phil uh, with his book, Yakshini Magic, uh, which I deeply enjoyed. We talk a little bit about Yakshini Magic in the book, but uh, let's, um, let's have a quick read of the foreword. Of all the Indian goddesses, Kali is probably the most well-known and recognizable. Despite her South Asian origins, she can now be considered to be trans-global in her influence. She is everywhere, the inspiration for art, devotion, poem, song. 
She is hailed as an empowering feminist icon and revered by witches. She has absorbed and been melded with the other dark goddesses, such as Hecate, as an archetype of primordial power. Her temples span the world, from the heart of Bengal to North America and to Southeast Asia, and virtually on, on the World Wide Web. Kali has been endlessly psychoanalyzed. She has appeared in the cover of Time magazine as a stark representation of the partition of India. She has inspired imagery as distinct as the Rolling Stones' tongue logo and the illustrations of William Blake. She has appeared in comics and graphic novels worldwide, from the retellings of the Devi Mahatamiya to Peter Milligan's Rogue and Josh. She has been featured in films such as The Stranglers of Bombay, The Beatles' Help, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. She was merged with the hero Xena in an episode of Xena Warrior Princess, the same episode that drew widespread condemnation from Hindus due to its depiction of Krishna. In 2017, Indian TV seri- the Indian TV series Mahakali and Hyai Aramba Hai, <coughs> Mahakali, the end marks the beginning, is a retelling of Kali's adventures in the Purianas and her battles against the demons. Many of Kali's characteristics first appear in the Devi Mahatamaya, a Purianic text which has been dated between the 5th and 6th centuries of the Common Era and forms part of the Markandiya Purana. The Devi Mahatamaya is an important work and perhaps the first in the development of the concept of a single great goddess, Mahadevi, with multiple aspects identified as the ultimate divine reality. It is also the first Purana in which Kali appears as a fully developed. The text comprises three frame stories and Kali appears in the third story. Here, two Asuras, Sumba and Nisumba, have wrestled the rulership of the three worlds from the Divas. The gods call on the goddess, Kandika, for help. At first, Kandika easily defeats the armies of the Asuras. Later, facing off against the Asura generals Kanda and Munda and their vast horde who were attempting to capture her, Kandika's face blackens with wrath and Kali emerges from her forehead. Kali easily destroys the horde of Asura warriors and mounting Kandika's vehicle, a line, she slays the two generals, presenting their heads to Kandika, who, reward, who rewards Kali with the epithet Kamunda. Later, Kali fights the demon Raktabija and each drop of blood he sheds causes another instance of him to spring up. The divas are helpless against this seemingly indestructible foe, but Kali drinks the blood as it falls to the ground and devours the many instances of the demon. She helps Kandika slay the demon. The Devi Mahatmaya describes Kali as black in colour, with emaciated skin, wearing a pelt of a tiger and a garland of human heads. She has a wide, gaping mouth, which is fanged, She's hollow-eyed, and her roars echo into the four directions. She cackles as she decapitates the Asuras. She pounds the earth with her hands. The noise she makes drown out all other sounds. She bears a noose, a spear, a sword, a staff, topped with a skull. She is both physically grotesque and violent, drinking blood and devouring her enemies. She embodies and expresses anger and fury. She inspires terror and fear. Kali makes a similar appearance in many of the Puranas. In the Linga Purana, for example, Siva asks the goddess Paravati to destroy the demon Duruka, who can only be killed by a female. Paravati enters Siva's throat and, drinking the poison sword in his throat, transforms herself into Kali. She emerges accompanied by flesh-eaten Visakas and defeats the demon and his army. She becomes so intoxicated with bloodlust that Shiva has to calm her down, lest she destroy the entire world with her fury. In the Vamana Purana, Siva taunts Paravati, calling her Kali due to her dark skin. Paravati, offended, takes herself off to perform austerities to rid herself of her dark complexion. She succeeds and is henceforth called Gori, the Golden. Her discarded dark form becomes Koseki a ferocious warrior Devi, out of whose fury Kali emerges. It is in the context of the rise of tantric traditions that the different view of Kali emerges. No longer is she just the embodiment of anger or fury of the great goddess, but she progressively emerges as a Mahadevi in her own right, 
the supreme ontological reality and generative power. She is both transcendent and imminent, present and hidden, the embodiment of time and beyond time, everywhere in the cosmos, the elements, the tattvas, and the very heart of the sadhaka. And Phil goes on. I am both delighted and honoured to present Kali Magic, Mike McGee's second book with my Twisted Trunk imprint. Kali has a special place in my heart insofar as back as 1982. It was an occurring dream of her that first sparked my interest in tantric traditions. She appeared in my dreams, breathed in flame, hair streaming, laughing wildly. I hardly knew anything about her at that point, saving perhaps a few descriptions and interpretations I had accounted in occult books. I have been de- I've been a devotee ever since. When I first encountered Mike's translations of Tantric's text some years later, they were invaluable in shaping both my practice and deepening my understanding of these esoteric traditions. Okay, let's uh, let's get into things. Um, so before we get into the show, you can find more about Mike McGee's work in the links in the show notes and indeed a uh, link to Twisted Trunk Publishing. You can find out uh, more about um, the various different books you can pick up there. Um, Kali Magic and Yakshini Magic, they're special books, you know, um, because it's this, this so little attraction from the source material, you know, um, and as Westerners who are, well, I feel like me and a bit obsessed with um, Hinduism and kind of more broadly kind of the Indian, Indian uh, esotericism, that stuff's invaluable. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's 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 good stuff. And uh, before we get into it, the sound isn't great in parts. So, you know, patience is a virtue. Can't get it right every time, but it's good stuff. So, uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Mike McGee, you are very welcome to the Spirit Box. Nice to have you on the show. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. Now, to, to get everything uh, moving and to get uh, folks orientated, could you tell us a bit about yourself and your work? Sure. Um, my name is Mike McGee. Although my name is McGee, I have three Scottish grandparents and one Irish grandparent. Um, I was born in Aberdeen, Scotland, and my mum believed in fairies. Um, she said, uh, Mike, you know, if you chop down anything from a tree, leave an offering for the fairies. And she also did um, strange things, you know, like um, read tea leaves and stuff like that. And I said, Mum, you know, what the hell is going on? I, mean, I didn't say the, the hell word, because that would be a thrashing for me. You know? I said, what the heck's going on here? Even heck would have been a thrashing. And uh, she said, well, you know, our family, our family is from Scotland, and um, Scotland's the land of the fairies and the pips and the pixies. And um, and uh, she was forced to convert to um, Catholicism because she was a Protestant, and she wasn't allowed to uh, have children unless she signed a note to the Pope saying, "I promise to bring my children up in uh, in Catholicism." I thought that's very interesting indeed, you know. Um, but when I was six, she said. Um, don't believe any of this papers nonsense. <laughs> I'm from I'm from Aberdeen and uh, and I believe in the pixies and uh, the power of nature, and uh, that's my beginnings. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, <laughs> it sounds about right, doesn't it? Do you know, like um, one of the things I find that I interview people from all over the world, and if. I, I'm almost shocked if someone says, uh, well, my my grandparents are from somewhere in Scotland or somewhere in Ireland. Like they're, they're, there's, And I think what you said there about it being under the fairies makes an awful lot of sense because these are people from all over the world. And it's it's an ancestry thing for so many people. Um, that connection with 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 these uh, with these spirits. Um, but. One of the reasons that uh, obviously we're uh, you're 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 on the show uh, today is some of um some of your 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 books and I just finished your your latest book uh, uh this weekend just gone uh Kali Magic 
and your previous book I read a couple of years ago, um, Yakshini Magic. We talk about cutting off bits of trees and the trouble you might get. Um, that falls right under Yakshini Magic. But I suppose we can come to that later. But just after finishing uh, the book Kali uh, Kali's Magic, Kali Magic, I wanted to ask you about um, firstly, kind of uh, what drew you to Kali as as a subject, um, and you know, quite interestingly, you know, you're 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 dealing with the original source material. You know, what's that like? And kind of um, through the process of writing the book, you know, has your view on on Kali changed? There's three questions all in one. There, that's we we can we'll we'll take our time with them, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how we get on. Good answer. It's, it's really puzzling. It's really puzzling to me. Um, I I, uh, I wondered about this for years and years. I'm seventy three just, and um, when I was a wee kid, um, my uh, my uncle, my uncle Mac, was um, in charge of the uh, the railways, Northwest Indian Railways, and um, and um, in his house in Ballater, uh, which is near Aberdeen, he had so, so many fascinating uh, Indian artifacts. Uh, I looked at this stuff and I thought to myself, what the heck is going on here? So I was interested in that. Um, I've often wondered why I'm interested in India, but um, that was obviously one influence. And then my dad, when I was eight, said to me, um, said to me, uh, Michael, because I was called Michael, you know, not Mike. My mum and dad used to play that trick on me. <laughs> we're talking to you, Michael. We're not talking to you, Mike. You know. Um, my dad said to me, he was stationed in the Second World War in, um, in India, in Delhi, and um, obviously he knew my uncle Mac, um, and he said he was on a sentry duty as a corporal in the RAF on this ancient track in Delhi, and one night um, I saw him, approached him, and my dad had a bayonet on his rifle, and he said, stop, who goes there? And uh, this, my dad's Hindi was quite good. I think, I don't know, but I think. And uh, the Stardew said to him, This is my ancient track. I've um, I've traveled, and my ancestors have traveled this track for thousands of years on our way to uh, a temple. And uh, the Stardew said to him, Okay, in Hindi, obviously in Hindi, he said, Okay, I'm going to curse you. Um, you're going to have three children, three boys, and the second one is going to be a sadhu. And unfortunately, I'm the second boy. So I think I was born as a sadhu. That's what you say to me. <laughs> oh man, that's brilliant. Well, that's a very good origin story. Yeah. I wish I'd made it up, but I hadn't. Yeah. <laughs> and, go, go ahead. In between questions. Well, you were working with the the source material. Like, what well, what's that like? You know, oh, interesting. I, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I had this experience when I was um, twenty six, twenty seven, something like that. Um, I had this dream, um, and in the dream. I wasn't interested in the Indian tradition at all, despite the fact my uncle Mark was in charge of the um, Northwest Indian Railways, and my dad told me the story when I was out. I had this dream uh, when I was 26, and I wasn't interested in Indian esoteric traditions at all. So I woke up in this dream, and this mantra um, was vibrating in my heart. And uh, it was a lucid dream. At first, and as I felt the um, as I felt the the dream, um, in a lucid state, I started to feel this um, this feeling of real bliss inside my heart, and then um, a mantra sounded in my heart, and then I woke up. I mean, as in the waking state rather than lucid state, and it was still vibrating in my heart. And I could hear it pulsing and pulsing again. And I woke up, you know, I woke up and I thought, well, that's quite an extraordinary experience. Um, 
India is obviously very important to me. So um, that's when I started investigating the Indian traditions. Yeah, and when you started um, looking at the Indian traditions, um, did you you went about like learning to read um, Sanskrit and and speak uh, Hindi and, and and so forth? Yeah, it's because of that. Yeah, it's because of that experience. Yeah. Otherwise, I wasn't interested. I mean, mm. I'm self-taught, so you know, if you if you teach yourself stuff, it's not quite you know accurate as academia would be. Mm. Um, but I got so interested in the language and the nuances, and um, and that's how I got into the into my interest in Kali and the Yakshanese and um, yeah. other elements of Indian uh, Indian esotericism. Yeah. Uh, it's remarkable stuff. I, I like. I, I, I'm a great admiration of, for the 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 a the intellectual capacity, but also the drive to 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 learn uh, Sanskrit. I, I've at the start of lockdown, I purchased two books on um, learning Sanskrit. Put them on a shelf. Worked out right. They'll be. Um, I'll pick them up on a, on a weekly basis and start doing my. Uh, learning my Sanskrit I think they're still on the shelf Mike you know unfortunately I didn't quite show quite the discipline I did come up with a podcast instead I did make in fairness I did create this podcast but I have um I have a, a, a genuine interest in that being able to engage and and read the source material I, I think it's it's so important looking at like the the translations of certain words can have such an important bearing on, on you know a non a non Hindi uh, speaker in t- interpreting these texts. It's a very difficult language actually, and um, uh, I am not an academic. Mm. The best thing about the chantras is that they're written in very simple Sanskrit, more or less. Right. You can, unless you go into the higher realms. Um, yeah. Of people like Abhinavagupta, who was um, a Brahmin in the eleventh century, or something like that. Um, with Sanskrit was obviously perfect. Um, nobody yeah. quite explained to me why the Buddhists um, were destroyed in the ninth or eighth century of the Christian era, you know. But Brahmanism and uh, Abhinavagupta was still interesting. His Sanskrit is so excellent that I couldn't make head or, head or tail of it. Really? The tantras, the tantras more or less the ones that are, um, I've translated in the, the in Kali magic. Are written in very simple Sanskrit, mm. very simple Sanskrit. Um, mm. that, that even I can you know, understand, but right. the high flowing stuff, I haven't a clue. Yeah, yeah. No, <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. I've been I've been uh, working a lot with um, with like Irish language source material for a piece. I'm 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 um, almost finished and uh, and like once you get to some of that kind of like early medieval stuff it's like forget it like just forget it it's, it's completely it yeah you need a proper academic you can you know to, um, decipher that it's 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 so uh so complex it is to me anyway my my level of irish um with uh with that work though that the, the the tantra stuff um because because there's, there's a, a huge amount in 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 kali magic in, in this book uh, like a, a huge amount of of different um, different material you've translated. Um, what what was the what was the bit that surprised you the most out of the work that you you translated or prepared for for this manuscript? Sorry, say the question. What was the what was the the bit that came out about Kali or Kali Tantra? That surprised you the most? Well, first of all, it's a very living tradition in Bengal. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of millions of people in Bengal and across India uh, think Kali is a, a very important uh, goddess to be to be worshipped. But you know, Hinduism is described as a religion, but Tantra is not a religion. Um, it's a practice. Mm. Uh, you know, people go to church. Um, well, I didn't. Uh, I got. Uh, 
I've got several more to sentences in my in my <laughs> fucking English. Oh, sorry, it's Richie is the, the word I work here. I've got several very um more to sins, but um what interests me is is that um the worship of Kali is uh, is a religion like Catholicism or uh, yeah Buddhism is a religion. The inner side is way, way more different. Um and I guess that you know many people in Bengal and the rest of India go to the temple whenever it's the, the holy days and you know give um offerings to the goddess Kali, but the goddess Kali is not the goddess Kali without, it's the goddess Kali within. It's the um it's the experience of um in, in a tantric tradition that the goddess or the god is within you, not outside you. And how is that a how does that experience manifest? Do you mean the religion or do you mean the oh, wait, the way you were describing how Kali is within you rather than without, like it's not an external thing. So when if somebody is saying they're they're experiencing Kali within, what what does that? How is that? How would that experience be described? The tantric practice is uh, the tantric practice is uh, you you uh, create a, a space uh, where you can meditate. It's the wrong word because that's too. Too new edgy, really. Um, create a space, and inside that space, um, you visualize the goddess as within your heart. And you, um, this is the puja, the, the practice that, that tantrics do. And so you visualize yourself as the god or goddess that you must identify with in your heart. And you take her from your heart into one of your nostrils on a flower and you place the flower on a yantra and then the goddess is or the god is present and then you can offer um, all sorts of stuff you know you can do sex and you know drugs and rock and roll well, i don't know that rock and roll in those days but you know you know what i mean and um you do all the stuff you you may recite the mantra thousand and eight times and then when you've when you've finished, um, you take the, the, the flower back to your nose, inhale, inhale the nose, uh, inhale the, the flower into your into your lungs and into your heart. And um, you were you are the goddess or the god. And that's the, the practical ritual, basically, of the tantric tradition, whether it's Krishna or uh, Vishnu or Shakti or Shiva or you know whoever, even the even the scary ones. So does that answer your question? Yeah, no, yeah, that, I'm very interested in it from a like from a, a a a practical perspective of what what does that practice look like? You know, which is one of the reasons I really enjoyed your book, you know, uh, and as well the Akshini magic because should you want to the 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 practices are are are, are laid out um, <clears throat> to some degree. Um, certainly, one of the things that came up with the Kali magic um, tantra was it's it's quite explicit in some areas. Like it's very mm-hmm. very. Mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like the the. the uh, less about about the female genitals. Yes, yeah. the the only the only um, tantra. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's quite extraordinary, really. Um, Remarkable. Yeah. Um, I don't quite, I can't quite figure it out. I've talked to some of my, um, my friends, um, some of them, you know, serious Sanskrit scholars, unlike me. Yeah. They think it's completely outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> and it is. Yeah. There's, no, there's no hidden message in there. It's, um, no, not at all. It, 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 it is not encoded. Like yeah. it is very, very, you know, there's no oblique language here. It's, 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 it's not pornography, but you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is absolute like physical veneration yeah. of, of, um, of the, the, the female reproductive organs. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can hardly explain it to myself to tell you the truth. Yeah. But there's a tradition, uh, a Vishnu tradition, um, 
they grew up in uh, an area in India called Kuch Bihar, where I don't quite know how to describe it really. I'm still puzzling, puzzling it on myself. It's a Vishnu tradition, and um, the, the Vaishnavas, uh, I'm not going to diss anybody here, but the Vaishnavas are, generally speaking, more Protestant than the, than the Shaivites, you know. They're a bit more regular than the Shaivites, but um, they, they worship us of Shiva rather than yeah. Vishnu. Yeah. And I think they thought to themselves, I, I might have got this totally wrong, and um, I, I probably have. I think they thought to themselves, hey, there's a great game going on in the, in the, in the Shivite area. And uh, <laughs> you've got this Madhvi, which means Madhvi is actually related to the word mead, you know, mm -hmm. as in the drink. Yeah. Uh, we've got this goddess Madhvi, and maybe she could um, give us a clue as to what's going on here. So I think there's a, a, a what's the word for it? Um, a dual tradition where the people who worshipped, which is the wrong word, Vishnu, the people who worshipped Shiva actually had something in common. And sometimes, you know, I don't know if you know this, but um, in the medieval times, Christian era, the Vaishnavas, the worshippers of Vishnu, and the Shaivas, the worshippers of Shiva, had huge wars. And, Told each other because they wow. thought the God was, was the real God. Wow, um, really? Yeah, yeah. I was in a place called um, Kajarao, very famous place in India, full of erotic temples. And, um, uh, yeah, I know the one. It's in, is that yeah. in Uttar Pradesh, near uh, Lalabad. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I've been to see, I've been up to the, uh, the existing Shiva temple there, um, where there was a still an existing. Um, Ling, you know, the, the symbol of the, yeah. the forest. And um, I came down and they given me a, a strike on the head, which means that I'd be up and, um, you know, bowed down to the linga. Well, I didn't bow down, I said, you know, up in arms. And I came down, there was a kid in the car park, you know, we're leaving uh, Kajara. And the kid saw my, saw my uh, the strike on my head and he said, you yeah, uh, know, he's about 13, 14 years old. He said, no, he said, um, no, he don't believe in Shiva. He's a real god. The real god is Vishnu. I said, why the fuck are you at school? <laughs> I had no idea there was like that kind of historic tension between. Yeah, yeah. Big time. Yeah. Muscular people, you know. And I suspect yeah. the reason that um, Buddhists were driven out of India in the 9th or 8th century right. was they were killed. Yeah. By sectarian uh, by. people who said, we can't have, um, especially if, well, my daughter was do this, I would say this really in case I upset the Brahmins, but I think the, I think the Brahmins thought, these bloody Buddhists are really fucking uh, turning the world on our heads, you know. They mm. don't believe in the Vedas, they don't believe in the Upanishads, they think that everybody's equal. Well, I'm not sure the Buddhists think that, but, you know, yeah. is equal. Yeah. Let's get these bloody Buddhists out of our country before it convert our country into some kind of weird Buddhist democracy. <laughs> and, you know, to continue, all these murders that are happening in uh, in, in in countries like Sri Lanka and um, yeah. Thailand and, and Burma, mm -hmm. these are all Buddhists. Yeah. yeah. The precept of Buddhism is um, yeah, stop killing people. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That's religion for you. Something different, this, this. From something different from religion yeah yeah but in terms let's get back to to, to Kali one thing I noticed quite a lot reading through these texts is um, but, but besides the, the kind of the the kind of this slightly sexual obsession that that's there with with the Kali practice is and I found it similar with Yakshini magic is that the actual number of times that it's uh, required one repeats a mantra. Like they can be the tens of thousands or the hundreds of thousands. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask about that is, is that just one of those practices or suggestions that is, is deliberately there to kind of keep away um, 
the curious or the people who aren't particularly committed to to the tantra or is it the genuine practice yeah it's genuine practice wow uh, the reason being that i think i mentioned in the book um, is that you and me the ideal number is that we'll breathe um 21,600 um, breaths a day. Half of those are solar, half of those are lunar. Obviously, we don't. You know, sometimes we um, will breathe less than that or more than that. If we're relaxed, we, we'll breathe more or less than that. Um, if we're panicked, we'll probably freeze up and breathe. You know, but it's an ideal. It's an ideal. Um, so the, the 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 most famous or most famous is one word. Um, the most important mantra in the uh, tantric traditions, many of them, is um, something called a japa, which means you breathe in and you breathe out. And as you breathe in and breathe out, you actually are reciting the mantra. And that mantra is called angsa, which means the swarm, but it means ha and sa. So if you concentrate on your breath, you actually are breathing in and out. 21,600 times a day. And obviously, if you're asleep, you're still breathing. Mm. You know, you're still remembering the mantra, but that's the most important mantra um, breathing in and breathing out. So, this 108,000 stuff is um, irrelevant because we do that every day, you know, we breathe in and breathe out. But the one thing we don't do is realize that we're breathing in and out. And it can't use time. So, in these countries, both um, both the Kali persuasion and the Triviji persuasion, it's very important that um, we remember to breathe. Because also breathing is good for you, you know. Mm. If you don't breathe, we'd be fucking dead, won't we? <laughs> Which I hope to be soon, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely lack of breathing presents some significant <laughs> problems. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And and um, but that's that's remarkable. I like um, it's interesting that it's, it's explained that way. Um, because I remember reading when I was, I mean, it's a couple of years since I read Yakshini Magic, but I remember kind of reading through that and kind of going the the count, or and like it's quite specific in this like an like, extraordinarily large number of times that that mantra has to be recited, you know, and also in specific locations and auspicious times. All, all the uh, the kind of layers of complexity um, to develop a relationship with uh, the particular yakshini. Um, r- really interesting, and and then in in Kali magic, um, some of the some of the 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 the, the puja and and rituals reminded me of some of the practices. Uh, attributed to the to the agori you know uh particularly like um like the the shava sadhana that kind of thing um and there was one description in the book where uh a sadhu would uh would copulate with his kind of a representative of, of the goddess um but it had to be kind of a, on top, uh, on top of the body of a freshly killed warrior, preferably a prince, you know, like um, like very specific details, um, for the for it to work, you know, and and like to to a Westerner, like that sounds, you know, completely insane, uh, for a multitude of reasons, but. Like we were talking, I mean, obviously you've been all over India and I've been all over, mainly North India, but actually in Varanasi, you know, there there are bodies everywhere. It's possible for that to happen, you know, uh, for those circumstances to 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 occur for somebody to do that. Um, but I guess it it would be slightly more difficult now than when these were first written down. But the proximity of death and bodies. Is is a very real thing. It's a, a thing that we don't really understand in the West. We're we're very very removed from that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I've been to Varanasi, but only once. And um, in those little gullies, you know, as you go from uh, from cremation ground to cremation ground, there are bodies coming past you all the time. And yeah, I know that's about Hinduism, actually. You know, 
Mm. Here in the West, you know, uh, when my dad died, uh, it was kind of concealed. Um, mm. It was very, very, um, it's very hidden, the, the fear of death, you know, or death itself. So, you know, I got to the crematorium and my daddy would be there, you know, being burnt in the fucking flames. Sorry, I used the F word again. So, you know, my, my daddy was in the coffin being shoveled into the crematorium and uh, and uh, all the family was there and we all felt very, very sad about it, obviously. Mm. But it was very clinical, you know. It was like um, the ashes were delivered in some little pot, you know, which we could do something with if we wanted to, you know. Maybe, you know, stick it into a curry and uh, and eat it. <laughs> do you remember our dear daddy, your mother, yeah? <laughs> And uh, in India, it's very plain, uh, very plain what mm-hmm. death is, because you see it on the streets every day. Dogs, cats, people, you know, mm-hmm. camels, elephants. It's very plain. It's, uh, in, in, in this country, in, in Oxford, uh, I don't even know where the nearest crematorium is. I've got to get to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, it's, it's one of the last taboos, uh, I think, in, in Western culture. Um, this is taboo. I'm not quite sure about that, but um, we talk about sex, we talk about marriage, we talk about birth. So death is definitely something that all of us, uh, and probably even in India, none, none of us want to see our loved ones um, died. But yeah, you know, about, yeah I like us a lot. What I what I am interested in about in Indian culture. And also in Islamic culture is they recognize death, you know. Yeah. So in Islamic culture, as you know, the bodies should be interred within a day. And uh, in Hindu culture, they've got to be burned. And uh, I've seen that happen, you know. I've seen that happen where, you know, the eldest son, if there is an eldest son, because I think an eldest son is very important to mainstream Hinduism. Yes. Use an axe to left the skull of, um, of, uh, of the dead parent. And uh, I don't think we see anything like that in, um, in Oxford <laughs> or uh, Dublin or Aberdeen. Yeah, know? yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a very interesting point. Taboo, you know. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. And there's a huge amount to, to unpack when you look at it. I mean, with the, like the proximity to the, to the, to the body of a loved one um, and how that, you know, you will see literally your parents' body burn. Like that's like not not in one of those crematorium, you know, ovens. There's no curtain hiding it. You see the the full on the real deal. Um and there's no getting away from that. And I think I think actually, a lot of interrupt, but actually that's what I like about Irish culture, because uh, when I was eleven, my dad um, took me to the local co op. Yeah. Uh, um, there was a wake going on, an Irish wake. Yeah. And in that wake, um, the coffin was upright, and the the dead person was um, was there. And my dad said, um, "You know, the man who had his second son, that's this something." Well, but the lovely daddy said, um, "Look at that! This is an Irish wake. Mm-hmm. The, the body is in the coffin, upright, and uh, the Irish people are." Drinking, having fun, you know, celebrating his or her life. And I thought, I looked at it and thought, wow, you know, this is is real, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I definitely think it's it's similar territory, you know. It's a it's a celebration of the life at the death, um, and also the keening tradition, you know, of, of like the the professional keeners. Who would go and uh, cry by the body, you know? Um, and yeah, it would, it would remind you. I mean, it sounds Indian. That's a, a that's a stretch and a, a reach and a half. But you know that the, there there definitely is a to the untrained ear uh, some similarities. But I, I the the whole cre- uh, cremation uh, the whole cremation spectacle and experience. Yeah, I think it's fundamentally tied to the idea of like reincarnation, you know, and 
getting yourself to, to if you can get to Varanasi and be burnt there and go into the Ganges and get to trying to get the the release from from um, so Moshka or or Samsara, they're like to be released from that cycle is obviously important, but it's still that whole idea of it's just the vessel. Whereas in Christian countries, you know, you've got you got one shot at goal and that's it, right? You know, so it's a little bit more this is it. <laughs> you got nothing else. <laughs> Whereas in, in, in countries uh, that have a, a, a foundational belief in reincarnation, it's less of a thing. It's not to diminish anybody's you know emotional distress and pain at losing a loved one. But there's a, an underpinning that's just psychologically different of, of thinking, well, this is just the start of the cycle again. I'm just thinking of Colleen. I'm just a worshipper of Colleen, far from it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a way, um, if you if you sorry, let me calm down a bit. If you if you feel if you do a puja, an Indian puja, whether you're a Vaishnava or a Shaiva, you're actually possessed. You you're visualizing the goddess or the god within your heart. So you're possessed. Mm-hmm. What you do is you take it on a flower or anything onto a yantra or you know onto a book or onto, you know, a human being, you're possessed and you're actually um, delivering something. That's, that's what tantric initiation is like too. You know, if you initiate a person, you take the goddess or the god into your own heart, you, the mantra vibrates hopefully rather than being a symbolic thing. And you are, you're possessed. Um, and you're giving your possession to a flower or a yantra and uh, and um, you're worshipping and then you take it back into yourself but actually you know you're visualizing or realizing yourself as the goddess of the god you know and the thing about this Kali book is I was very interested to see the the note on the back by um by some scientist or academic you know at Leiden University mm-hmm. where it is this is it a book about liturgy. And it is. It's a book about ritual. It's like a, it's like a missile. You know, mm-hmm. like when I was a kid, I used to have to read this missile. And luckily, I was born after the time where, when you went to confession, there was a list of sins that you could confess. You know? But this is the this is liturgy. It's, it's, it's the it's the ritual. It's nothing to do with the um, nothing to do with the um, realization, which I think is. The most important thing about, about being a tantric that you realize yourself rather than go through these endless rituals where, mm-hmm. like a Catholic mass or you know, mm-hmm. whatever other religions do. It's a religion, there's a religion, so it's supposed to be about being itself, I think. Yeah, no, I don't think I know. Okay. It's different. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Like the Western perception of Kali, we obviously were presented with this, you know, terrible figure with her her, her um, garland of heads and and her her skirt of of, of hands and the, the 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 lolling tongue and the dripping blood from the demon's head. We're presented with all these extremely like visceral images, and then there's no, numerous passages in 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 the book. Um, around the details of how she will manifest sometimes, or instructions on how to visualize her, um, where she presents as this ter- the terrible goddess, you know, this this ferocious being. Um, why why is that? Why is she presented as this ferocious being? Um, basically, because um, you see, yantra, the yantra. Um, there's 15 um, eternities, niches, which represent the 15 um, days of the waning moon. Um, so, you know, when the new moon comes, um, the Kali, uh, the 15 Kali niches come. And when the full moon comes, the, the 15 uh, lovely um, niches come, the ones of Lalita or Tripura Sundari. 
it's a good spell. Um, I'm just going to say, spot being dead and being alive. So when the moon's uh, waxing, you're alive, you know, you're alive. Mm -hmm. um, when the moon starts waiting, waning, you're dead. Um, so the whole circle, the whole, the whole 30 days um, represents the beginning of um, life and the ending of life. So it's about time. Mm -hmm. that, that goes back to my father, the earlier thing about the, the breaths you take, because um, the breaths you take are related to Kali and Larissa. So an anger of breath might be Larita, an anger of breath might be Carl, might be Kali. So the whole two goddesses are related, and they're related by the fact they're both related to the phases of the moon. Nothing right. to do with the sun, it's all to do with the moon. Um, well, well, that's my feeling, in a way. Right. That's, that's really interesting. So you were saying the most important thing is about breath. Yeah. Yeah. Time. Um, breath is time. We, you know, the, the Brahmins have produced uh, a heap of literature about um, about this, but uh, the thing is that um, if we don't breathe, um, we're dead. Yeah. And the, the uh, cycle of the moon demonstrates that um, the breath is time, you know, unless we... Um, I, I'm not particularly a, a lunar mythologist for a bird, but because um, of course there's a bloody sun as well to take into account. But um, my point is that unless you breathe, um, you don't pronounce the mantra. Mm -hmm. The mantra goes on irrespective of whether you are conscious of it or not. Um, you don't have to say, I worship Kali. 10,000 times a day, um, that process is going on. Uh, whether you like it or not, the thing is to recognize that when you breathe, you breathe in, you breathe out, and that's the mantra. So that's answering the previous question of yours about, you know, do you really have to recite this um, 24, 25 million times a day? Yeah. You know? So if people want to pick up your books, or find out more about your work, where's the best place for them to do so? My website. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And do you have um, any other projects? Unfortunately, I do. Yeah. My publisher, my publisher Bill Hyde, is going to write two more books. Yeah? I come 73. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> I'm a cigarette. You know? I'm a drink. <laughs> Side into you know obscurity. <laughs> and have you have you settled on on the themes for those books, or is that top secret? Yeah, yeah. The first one is about um, yeah. My first book is about Hindu astrology, right? Not, not sort of you know conventional Hindu astrology, but you know yeah, Andrew Hindu astrology. My second one, oh my god, you know, gentlemen, this is a complete nightmare to me. I think it was trying to keep me alive. The second one is about um, something called Sri Vidya, the opposite side of uh, Kali. Because right. Lalita is sex, while you know, Lalita is death. Uh, sorry, while Kali is death. Yeah. So, I'm going to take me another 100,000 fucking, sorry, fucking words for that. Another 100,000 words. I have to keep my fingers in the water. You know what I mean? Well, I'm glad to hear Phil's keeping you busy. Thank you for the very long interview. <laughs> you're very welcome. You're very welcome. And you're very welcome back anytime you want to talk um, about your, your, your new projects. Yeah, good night. Good night. Enjoy your cigarette. It's been fun chatting to you, Mike. Take care. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you, Dash. You too. Take care.
interesting stuff. I hope you guys, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you, Mike McGee, for your time. Greatly appreciated. Um, you want to pick up a copy of things? Check the show notes for everything you need. Well, I think that's going to be the last show of the year. Yeah. So, um, adios, 2022. See you in 2023. I'm Darren Mason, and you've been listening to the Spirit Box. Take care and bye.